Okay, how's it going everybody? I hope you're all doing well. Okay, well, so in today's episode, I thought I'd try to say something about the French philosopher Simone de Beauvoir, and in particular, what she has to say in a section of her uh, classic work, The Ethics of Ambiguity. And keep in mind that this will be extremely general in nature, just uh, broad strokes. Okay, so what de Beauvoir partly does in this work is she examines a number of different ways in which people try to escape and misuse their freedom. And she does this by, by listing five prominent characters, or uh, better yet, stereotypes or archetypes of people who attempt to do this. All right, so you ready to, uh, to go through them? She gives them some uh, really cool names, by the way. Okay, so here we go. So what de Beauvoir does is she begins at, as she herself says, at the lowest rung of the ladder. That is, with the worst kind of person. The worst kind of um, freedom evader, you might say. Namely, the subman. Okay, so what's the, the subman like? Well, essentially, he's the most dangerous of the archetypes that she lists. And the reason for this is because He's inert, he's passive, he's mopey and apathetic, and he's fearful, and he's indifferent to finding meaning or purpose in life. He doesn't do much or create anything at all. He just, as de Beauvoir says, closes himself off and takes shelter in the ready-made values of the world. In, um, in Nietzsche's view, he'd probably be considered the last man. No term of endearment, by the way. In the language of the existentialists, being fearful, the sub-man's congealed himself in imminence. He's reduced himself to a pure facticity, to a thing or an object in the world, like a pebble or a tree. Now, aside from the issue of not owning up to his freedom and being afraid of possibilities in general, why is this type of person especially dangerous? Well, it's because the subman can easily be influenced or manipulated into groupthink or into the service of dictators or authority type figures. As uh, one commentator puts it, the subman is the sort of person who eagerly awaits commands and who's right ready for mobilization. Maybe another way of putting this is that the subman is the type of person who's most likely to become assimilated into a mob, one that's run, of course, by an authoritative and charismatic figurehead. Okay, well, so the next archetype, the next uh, freedom evader, and this is maybe the most common one, de Beauvoir calls the serious man. So you might say that the serious man thinks he, he solves the problem of freedom by stubbornly choosing some arbitrary goal or identity to define his values, values that he thinks are absolutely unconditional. What I mean is that he says that he's absolutely and concretely something. Like, for example, he says that he's a Christian or a communist or a husband or a liberal or a, a patriot. And this is who he is forever. In this way, he, he fixes himself, right? And he rejects his fluidity. And this is convenient because, well, it's convenient because he's able to relieve his existential weight. He's able to avoid the anxiety or the uneasiness of his freedom. That is, of having to make a genuine choice at every new moment. No, he just says, this is who I am completely and forever, period. But again, this is to hide behind a label, so to speak. It's to seek refuge in a fixed identity. It's to not admit to the subjectivity of one's goals, and so to not acknowledge the fundamental arbitrariness of one's existence. So the point is, is that there's clearly something inauthentic about the serious man. Okay, but like the subman, there's also something potentially very dangerous about him too. 
And the danger is this, that the serious man doesn't really question what he does or is or stands for. He thinks it's the absolute truth or has absolute value and he loses himself in it. But here's the thing, when one's goal or identity becomes fixed and uh, categorical like this, no sacrifice is too large to preserve it, right? The ends always justify the means. So there is a very real potential for the serious man to uh, transform into a tyrant or autocrat or cult leader. Actually, to illustrate this dangerous possibility, De Beauvoir gives a list of historical fanatics and administrators, all of whom were willing to kill millions of people in the service of some greater absolute value. And uh, keep something in mind, that those who did the actual fighting for the cause of these serious men, they were, well, they were probably the sub-men. Okay, so um, what's next? Well, the next archetype or theoretical stereotype that de Beauvoir talks about, one that issues from the eventual disorder of the serious man, is the nihilist. Okay, so in some ways the nihilist is a little more advanced, a little more authentic than the serious man. So how so? Well, unlike the serious man, the nihilist faces and he accepts the truth about the ambiguity and the arbitrariness of human existence, and he acknowledges that there just isn't a ready-made, pre-packaged, externalized meaning to this life of ours. As um, de Beauvoir herself says, the nihilist is right in thinking that the world itself possesses no justification and that he himself is nothing. Now again, Believe it or not, that's a positive step forward, de Beauvoir thinks. That's because there's some uh, lucidity or honesty there. But at the same time, there is a downside to the nihilist. It's this. What the nihilist thinks is that because nothing in particular is absolutely valuable, because human existence has no transcendent objective value, then therefore nothing matters at all. And so... Instead of creating something of his own, the nihilist gives up on life and um, tries to destroy it. As uh, de Beauvoir herself says, what the nihilist forgets is that it is up to him to justify the world. So, whereas the subman will blindly cater to tyrants and to dictators, and the serious man will forgo the needs of others for his own uh, so-called noble cause, the nihilist no longer believes in anything at all, so much so that it makes him dangerous, both to himself and to others. Okay, well, so the next archetype up the ladder is somebody de Beauvoir calls the adventurer. And uh, as the idea of the latter suggests, the adventurer is one up on the nihilist. So, like the nihilist, the adventurer also recognizes the ambiguity of the world and that things are arbitrary and that life comes without a pre-planned purpose. But here's the thing. Instead of succumbing to this void like the nihilist does, the adventurer takes this as an opportunity to get out there in the world and to create his own values. He throws himself into his projects and explorations with zeal and with enthusiasm, says de Beauvoir. He lives the exciting and the romantic life. And most importantly, he does all this by making use of and asserting his freedom. He sees his freedom as a positive value, not as something to hide from or as something um, debilitating. Now, all this is pretty great, but again, like with the other archetypes, this way of life is also not without its problems. And the biggest problem with the adventurer is that in the manifesting of his own existence, in the pursuit of his own projects and conquests, he disables the freedom of others. 
It's sort of like the inveterate uh, womanizer, Don Juan. He has his freedom and his fun, right? But at the expense of others. So the adventurer is, well, he's selfish. He doesn't understand that his own undertakings affect other human beings. And so to live like this is to ultimately participate in a kind of oppression, says de Beauvoir. Okay, well, so the last major archetype that de Beauvoir explores is the passionate man. Now, the passionate man, unlike the subman and the serious man, doesn't evade or try to escape from his freedom. In this way, he's like the adventurer. Now, as the name suggests, the passionate man is, well, he's very passionately attached to the choices that he makes. Actually, in some ways, the passionate man resembles the serious man in the sense that they both live by some value, some principle that they organize their life around. But yet, there's a fundamental difference between them, a really important one. It's this. While the serious man chooses a ready-made label or value to live by, the passionate man chooses something out of a self-conscious assertion of his own freedom. So while the, uh, the serious man chooses something that's external to him, you know, like uh, he says, I'm going to be a cookie cutter Republican or whatever, what the passionate man chooses and commits to is going to be something, as uh, de Beauvoir says, that springs entirely from his own unique subjectivity. Now, it seems that de Beauvoir thinks that the passionate man comes pretty close to exhibiting real freedom. But, like all the other archetypes, there are potential problems with him as well. I mean, for example, even though the passionate man can give incredible meaning or contribution to the world through his single-minded, passionate project, there is the danger that, in doing so, he will retreat from others and that he'll become monomaniacal in his outlook and so pursue his project at all cost. In other words, there's the danger that his freedom becomes a, uh, a separation from others and that, well, that he'll treat others as a means to his own ends. So, at the end of the day, as I mentioned at the outset, I think that what de Beauvoir is partly doing here is trying to show us how we either escape or misuse our freedom. If we're like the subman or the serious man, we'll basically refuse to acknowledge our freedom at all, reducing ourselves to, to things, or as the existentialists put it, committing ourselves to pure facticity. But on the other hand, if we're like uh, the nihilist or the adventurer or the passionate man, the risk is, is that we'll likely misuse our freedom by, among other things, failing to acknowledge the freedom of others and distorting our relationship with them. Ultimately, and this might seem paradoxical, but I think that for de Beauvoir, the best way to ensure our freedom is to will the freedom of others. You see, the more we undermine others in our own path towards freedom, the more we're preventing our own freedom in the process. That's to say, my freedom, it's, well, it's dependent on others having theirs. I mean, think about it. If I want to get something done, if I have uh, an important project or contribution to give, the only way that's going to fully happen or manifest itself is if others are free enough to extend what I'm trying to build beyond my life, right? In other words, my will and my long-term projects only make sense and materialize in relation to those of everyone else. So, to really be free, to ensure the condition of freedom, is not to have the power to do anything we want, but it's to do all that we can to serve the cause of freedom itself, which means supporting each other as much as we can. Bye for now.